When you buy a telescope, you want the telescope with the highest possible magnification, right? Wrong. You want a telescope with high quality optics, a nice solid mount, and with as, as big an aperture as possible. And we're going to describe why. Uh, aperture meaning the size of the main lens or mirror. Here's the basic idea. Here's a, a car approaching from far away, closer and closer. When it's far away, those two headlights seem to merge together. And this happens, and you might say, well, it's because the headlight has a certain size. And I say it also happens for point objects. It happens for stars. And in resolving stars, what matters is what's called the Rayleigh criterion that we'll introduce here. <coughs> so uh, you have two objects, say two stars. And you're going to image them through a camera, through some aperture, or a telescope. And this aperture, aperture just means opening. <coughs> now let's say it has a diameter D. Then what's going to happen is that object one is going to produce this diffraction pattern on the screen. And object two is going to produce also a diffraction pattern on the screen. And if they're well separated like this, then you can tell on the image sensor on the camera or as you're looking through the eyepiece of the telescope, you can tell that there are two separate objects out there. <coughs> but if they're not well separated, and especially if the central maximum of those two patterns get close enough together that they're actually beginning to touch and merge, then you cannot tell that they're two sources. So what happens is, uh, well, let's just write it down. The, the Rayleigh criterion for resolving two point objects, two stars in your telescope or two distant points through your camera, um, two point objects are just barely resolved when the first dark fringe in the diffraction pattern of one object so let's say we're looking at object one, which is blue here. This is the dark fringe of the blue pattern. The dark here, dark here. It's a minimum. There's not much light there. This is the center. Um, so this point here corresponds to the center of this bright central spot. And these two points here correspond to the the first dark fringe. And they're just resolved, and the first dark fringe in the diffraction pattern of one object falls directly on the central bright fringe and the diffraction pattern of the other. So here's the other object represented in red. Here's his central bright fringe, and it corresponds, it's in the same spot as the dark fringe from the other. And that's what you see right here. The um, Actually, this is not quite that, that situation because we want this central bright fringe to coincide exactly with the dark fringe of this guy. So we actually need to move this circle in order for it to be, uh, to look like this Rayleigh criterion, we need to move this circle over to here. So its central bright fringe corresponds with the dark fringe from the other one then is the point you can't tell them apart. If you're further apart than that, as shown in the image without me before I started drawing on it, then you can tell that there are two uh, separate spots. But once you get to, to this overlap position here, you can't tell, your eye can't tell. And that corresponds to, this just comes right straight out of the last concept, uh, theta minimum is 1.22 lambda over d. And you say, well, hang on, Dr. Edwards, I thought it was sine of theta is 1.22 lambda over d. And I say, you're right. But let me show you <coughs> how those are related. The, but before I do, the larger the, the aperture d, 
the smaller the minimum angle and the greater the resolving power. How does that come out? This is the minimum angular separation between two things. So you're going to say, I got a star over there and a star over here, and I got an angle that's one degree between them. Can I resolve them? If that angle is greater than theta min, then you can resolve them with light of wavelength lambda. If that angle is less than theta min, you, then you can't resolve those two stars. So, but if you increase d, then you'll decrease this theta min. So the larger the aperture of your camera, if it's a 35 millimeter or whatever, um, that's a good aperture for resolution purposes. If you have a tiny little camera aperture, it's not going to resolve things as well. Same with the telescope. The bigger the aperture, the smaller, the, the, the finer resolution that you'll get in the image. And this has nothing to do with light gathering capacity. It has everything to do with diffraction, which is the key to understanding resolving power of microscopes and telescopes. All right, so uh, sine theta, how do we replace sine theta with theta? And the answer is that for very small angles, so if this is the angle theta measured in radians, the sine of theta is approximately equal to theta. So the, hmm, the green curve is the sine of the angle. So this one here. The red curve is just x, or theta. So we can think of this as um, theta, sine theta, or tangent theta. I'm, I've got x versus theta here. X, the x-axis is actually theta. And so, as you can see, sine of theta, the screen curve, and theta here, they look very similar for very small angles measured in radians. And so that's why we can replace sine theta by theta in this uh, equation. As long as the angles are small, then theta min equals sine of theta min. So, a slide that we showed before. Why do you want a large aperture telescope? Number one, you'll gather more light. Number two, you'll see sharper images. When you increase the magnification of the telescope, you'll see more detail in the telescope. Those are the two reasons why large aperture are important in a telescope. The bigger, the better. And uh, stable mount, quality optics, et cetera, et cetera.